either in a cluster or not in a cluster. So that's why we call it partition. In a soft sense, they're not really zero one. The memberships become a probability. It has like 80% chance of being in that cluster, or 60% chance, 40% chance of being in that So we do that. We talk about hierarchical. The idea of a group most similar items uh, in bigger in make bigger groups. So this is a usually done bottom up, although. Some implementations exist when it starts down and it splits things into clusters as opposed to joining them by the month. And uh, we talked about the density based. Uh, let's just call this uh, paint cam. Remember the paint cam from Windows 95? You put a paint. And it covers everything that can be reachable from where you put it, and it stops when you find some sort of border. It says, I can't go over this border. In a drawing, that border is maybe a line of a different color. For us, it would be lack of points to get if we close. If we density base, put a can, colors everything that's close enough. When it finds a gap, it just can't keep coloring, so it starts a different paint, different color. As you remember that we talked about this last time? Good. So we wanted, what our job today is, is to add more details to these things and talk about more practical stuff on it. So you can start the homework. Uh, the homework will be up maybe tomorrow or so. It'll be about two weeks. And we'll have two parts. One part will be the clustering part. The other part will be the soft mixture part. The soft mixture part is a little bit more difficult to implement. We're going to talk about Gaussian mixtures. And uh, while you can use, of course, libraries, in Gaussian mixtures that we're going to talk about next week, there will be some mathematical steps that you have to be very careful. The beauty of mathematics that works on theory, when it says, for example, invert the matrix, that's all nice and dandy for mathematicians, but when you are a computer scientist and you actually have to invert a real matrix in the computer memory, that's much harder. Mathematicians can say things like, I, I, I think you, you recall this, if the determinant of a matrix is non-zero, there is an inverse, right? Mm -hmm. And there's an exact formula or procedure how to get the inverse. That's all very good in theory. In practice, things are different. You can't just say, give me the inverse because the amount is not zero. If you say that, things are going to go way off. Right? So the problems here may be that uh, it's going to require a lot more back and forth. It's not that the algorithm is hard. The algorithm is three lines. But to get it to work, it's going to take some, some engineering. Okay? So we need to add one thing, <coughs> which is evaluation. of clustering output. That is, once we do clustering, how do we know it worked? Okay. So before I connect my, my slides and the projector and I start going through these slides, which are the ones I've already posted, I want to talk a little bit about this evaluation right here. So uh, I, I want to talk not so much about formulas, but how you should think about it. So I'm going to do it right here. Evaluation on hard partition clustering. So this part of evaluation concerns things that have been in a partition sense. Um, all these three can be implemented as partitions. And that's what we talked about today. We talk about this version of k-means, where every point, image, or text, or email goes exactly to one cluster. Hierarchical clustering, while it forms a tree all the way up when you join everybody. You guys remember? I start with the points. I start joining them, right? And it 
eventually I get everyone joined together in one cluster. If I cut this, I get right here three clusters, right? Those four partitions of the points, right? If I, if I, if I take this tree of joining and I cut it somewhere, if I cut it three lines, that means I have three hard partitions. Same thing for density. If I force every single point to have exactly one color of the paint, it's going to be everybody belongs to exactly one partition. Now, K means have a natural soft version. The other ones will have to think a little harder to see how we get the soft version. So that's going to happen next time. So now for partition, there's two main categories of, of evaluation. One is with labels. sometimes called categories or tasks uh, or tags or purpose tags Unsupervised machine learning, which is this class about, we usually don't have labels. The truth is we most of the time have some labels, if not all of them. The, the data mining unsupervised machine learning is not concerned whether you have labels or not, or with the data have labels or not. It's concerned with algorithms that do not use the labels. So if somebody gives you data set of labels, it doesn't mean that what you do with it necessarily it's a supervised machine learning. The supervised versus unsupervised is not whether the data has the labels or not, it's what kind of algorithms you use. The moment your algorithm uses the labels, like I, I think like in KNN, right? Obviously in KNN we use the labels. That's a supervised learning algorithm. That's part of the machine learning class. But we can use these data sets, the MNIST data set with images to do clustering without looking at the labels, right? So, but the advantage of having the labels is that when the clustering is done, we can use those labels to evaluate how well it works. It doesn't make clustering supervised because we use the labels for evaluation. The clustering algorithm itself <coughs> does not use the labels. As opposed to say, a decision tree or a regression algorithm that definitely uses the labels during training to learn something. How many people are familiar with basic supervised learning like regression or decision? Hands up. Okay, so all these algorithms will use some labels internally, validation or training, to determine coefficients, determine splits, whatever they do. Those are supervised learning algorithms. Again, I do have labels and all the data sets we have are gonna have labels but what we do with them, it's unsupervised because we don't use the labels in class. But we can use the labels for classification, for evaluation of the cluster. So how are we gonna do this? We want to have with labels, and of course we have another version without labels. Now, I, I don't wanna insist on formulas right now. You're gonna have to implement some formula and it's gonna be up to you to determine the engineering, maybe even find the formulas online and tell us how it goes. I, 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 my purpose here is not to describe an exact formula, but rather a principle. If I have labels, say I do have labels for the MNIST data set, right? Every single image in there, I know it's a three or four, five, one, two, or zero, right? Suppose somebody comes and say, I've got the clustering, I've got the partitions. Here's group one, group two, group three. Uh, don't be confused between group ID and the label ID. There's no promise that group number three corresponds to label number three or to label number five. There's just a bunch of groups. How would you determine if that clustering worked? Your first job, once you graduate, get to a company, somebody says, I group those images. Or even worse, somebody, your boss says, somebody else groups those images, not me. I have no clue what they did. But I have the IDs. I know it with each image, what, what group did he go? Now it's your job to determine if that person did a good job. What do you do? Same program. What? Same. One, one at a time. I take the label of the same program. 
The centroid, you mean, you mean the K means centroid? Yeah. First of all, centroids are not real images, right? Yeah. You guys remember this from last time? Yeah. That the centroids may not be necessarily one of the images in the data set. Mm -hmm. So I may not have labels for the centroid. The closest data point to the centroid possibly. Yeah, I check that closest image. I get its label. Say that's a seven. Then what? So if um, if the group, uh, so that means the uh, most of the data points in that group uh, need to be seven. And uh, you check it with another, you compare it with, uh, let's say, uh, a data point for whose label you know. So if both of if the attributes or uh, like you find out the similarity for both of them, uh, the one that you know and the one for the group. Okay. So he clearly doesn't know how to evaluate clustering, but he's trying very hard to cook it right now. That's a good thing. If somebody gives you a job like this, you shouldn't say sorry, buddy, sorry, my boss, I have no clue. Right? You want to cook it, but better cooking is to say, give me half an hour to cook it properly. You don't want to give an answer before you actually know what you're going to say, right? Right? You don't want to say, I have no idea, let me in peace. That's no good. But you don't want to say, okay, let me come up with something at random. Right? So anybody knows more principally how, how can I evaluate this? I take the centroid. Okay, so I take a centroid from a group, so that's a group of images. I take the centroid and what? And then you run an iteration of k-means and see k-means of the groups. I do what? Run the iteration of maybe k-means and check if any of the groups are changing. Uh, I don't think that's a good evaluation because k-means usually runs until convergence. So maybe you write in a different sense. Uh, somebody gives me those groups. I don't know if they properly run k-means or not and I'm going to run more iterations of k-means just to see if they converge. Maybe I can run three more iterations, it gets better. I can agree with that, that if somebody doesn't know to stop or not, but assuming the person who did the clustering knew what they were doing, let, let's not assume they're idiots without, right? Usually we don't want to make an assumption like that unless we have some evidence that these people didn't know what they did, right? Assuming they did clustering, if they run k-means, they probably run it until my question is not whether the algorithm ran properly or not, but rather whether it worked assuming it ran properly. Yes. So if you're given all the groups, we yeah. just go to each group and see all the data points over there. Are yeah, similar. I have all the groups. So we just go to each group and see all the data points in that group. See with our eyes? No, I mean, check that they are uh, similar to each other or not. If they're very similar to each other in each group. Similar so means what? I computed similarity values? Or? But the distance between, depends on the data point. That, that doesn't use the labels. What he said makes sense. Look in a group and look at all pairs in the group or sample some pairs and compute the similarity. And if the, those similarities are all big, that's good, presumably, because they're all in the same group. But that idea, I'm going to put it right here, doesn't use the labels. To compute the similarities, uh, I don't need any labels, right? I'm just sure you mean similarity, the same similarity I've computed to do k means to start with. So that idea belongs here. If I don't have labels, I'm going to have to look into inside the group. Here are the groups. Remember, those are partitions. So we're not worried about overlapping. We're not worried about points belonging half there and half there, nothing like that. Those are partitions. Here are my groups. And I think what he's saying, if you pick two points in the same group, you want the similarity between them to be high. If you work with distances, you want the distance to be low. But that's only half of the story. What's the other half of this story? No labels. So the one half is you pick the similarity in the same group, two objects in the same group, you want high similarity. The other half is? The other groups have higher, uh, more dissimilarity. Between groups, you want low similarity. So we have to come up with a mathematical formula that says I want the similarity maybe on average or as a total between all pairs that are in the same group to be high and the similarity between all pairs that are in different groups to be low. So there's a math formula that we need to cook up in. Yes? What? I can hear you. I can't hear you. F ratio, like the concept simplest. Uh, you mean with 
labels or without labels? Without labels. Look for um, similarity or like for F ratio to variance and look, look for within cluster group variance. You say F ratio? F ratio. F is the, what? what is F? Um, Fisher's. Oh yeah, yeah, the, the, but those are just different formulas, I think, on the same variant. Uh, again, we didn't have a formula yet. We talked about the principle. There is another thing that we can add to this principle. This, what we just described here, doesn't use any notion of centroids. But if I have centroids, maybe my formula, centroids again, I, I don't need labels to have centroids. The problem with centroids is I only have them when average works. Remember from last time? The notion of a centroid, it has to do with average order points in a cluster. That if you run k-means, that must have been possible because k-means needs the centroids. But some other algorithms like hierarchical clustering doesn't need centroids. And maybe can work with data that doesn't average necessarily. And then when you say, give me the centroid, I might say, I, I don't know how to give you a centroid. Maybe you need a notion like a median. But that's not so easy to find a median if you can't average things. Okay, so maybe I have a variant here with, with averaging. <clears throat> Somebody else want to say something? I was thinking in the lines of if we can see, if we have the centroids, we can see how spread the data is in a given cluster. Right, so he's adding another notion that we incorporate here. I draw these clusters nice and kind of equal sizes. Guess what? In practice, they're not nice, they're not equal sizes. In practice, what we might have is this guy very small and this guy is gigantic. So I think he's saying maybe you want to take into account the size of these clusters when you evaluate because this thing may be super small, few points, and these things may be wide, a lot of points, but also far away points. There'll be a lot of points in the middle, maybe some points here. And now how do you look at the distances between these two Right? You're saying you want the similarity in each cluster to be small. But look at this. How can this be small if the cluster is that big? So I think these are all interesting questions that we, we should answer in terms of how do we come up with an evaluation formula without labels? However, the easier thing is to do it with labels. So if I have labels, like in MNIST data, and labels are somehow the purpose of what I do. I represent that image for the purpose of getting a seven or a three. How would I use labels? So now I have labels, yes. Can you classify uh, each cluster? Is it possible to classify each cluster? So the cluster is just a subset of images. That's what it is. So I have a, a group that says the following image by IDs belong to this group. So you want to label it somehow? You want to classify it as what? Yeah. And if you classify each data point, you will know which one is the maximum in that particular cluster. So let's not worry about the classification as in supervised learning. I think we should say look inside the cluster and detect the majority. Because you may have different images. Say the majority is a seven. Let's call that cluster then a seven. Okay? And then? So I could go to each one of my clusters and label them by majority. That's a seven. That's a three. That's a one. This one it could also be a seven. There's another cluster in each majority data points are sevens. That's possible, right? That I can keep going to all the clusters and assign the majority labels to them, right? So that's saying, uh, here's my clusters here. I have labels now, so for every data point in them, I know the label. So I could say, okay, majority in this cluster, that's a three. Majority in this cluster, it's a one. Majority in this cluster, that's also three. And majority in this cluster, that's an eight. And I can keep going depending how many clusters I have. And now? You have to join all the majority with three and both the I have to join, three. meaning uh, union the groups? Union. Can't do that during evaluation. My job as an evaluator is not to improve the clustering algorithm. Whoever did the clustering, it's done. My job is only to figure out if it's good or not. So I can't join the clusters together. 
maybe that would have been better to join them as an output of clustering algorithm. But our job, especially by using labels, is not to improve the algorithm, <coughs> it's just to evaluate, give some sort of performance value, you know, like accuracy, or F measure, or precision, or recall, something that says, this clustering worked, the performance of it is 0.63. That means it's that good, yes. So after you give the majority score, we can actually see the accuracy of other points, whether it, it, it was actually right. So once I have a majority, I could look at all the points here and say how many of them are labeled as trees, right? So I could say accuracy versus, uh, you know, against the majority value. I could say that's 0.75 as a proportion, right? 0.75. What that means is 75% of these points agree with the majority and 25% of them do not. Maybe this other one has accuracy. Again, accuracy has to measure against something. I can't measure accuracy unless I compare some point with something that's being given to me like a sort of truth against this majority. Maybe that's here 0.9. more accurate, most of the points here are ones, right? So on and so forth. So people obviously have tried to think, if I do this, what would be a very good clustering? The one that has high, 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 high accuracy, right? That means a lot of the points are the same. But even then, there is the problem of, suppose the accuracy in here is 0.8. Even if I have high numbers, I still have the problem of, of the true two clusters that have the same kind of majority label, even though they're very accurate. So this measurement, how accurate you are, does not include everything I want. What would be, how, uh, there's an obvious problem here, which is there is a strategy to obtain guaranteed high accuracy, one. So suppose now you are not the evaluator. Suppose you are the person who runs K-means. And I'm telling you, I want you to create a bunch of clusters for the MNIST data set, such that the accuracy is super high, one. What would you do? Here we generate its own cluster. Right. If I do that, I put every single image in its own cluster, what would be the majority? Exactly the label of that image, because there's only one image. And what would be the accuracy for everybody? One. So that's no good, obviously. Uh, who wants to do clustering that way, right? So we need to add something here. So we can use something like a confusion matrix thing and get to know what is that. We can talk about confusion matrices. That's an interesting idea. So if I think about confusion matrices, um, that's, that's a concept you should know in all data science, confusion matrices has to do, what's a confusion matrix? A confusion matrix, it has to do with membership, membership uh, of data points to some category. Let's call it, um, I don't know, um, output versus membership of data points to some truth given table. So it's a matrix in which each data point, image, text, email, person, patient, it belongs, you know where it belongs in your output. That output could be a classification algorithm, could be clustering, could be whatever you're doing with the data. And somebody tells you the truth that you expect. So there'll be a bunch of classes for the truth, right? Like what's the truth in MNIST data set? How many classes are there? There will be 10 classes for MNIST because the truth comes to us as 10 classes. And there will be some classes for the output. That's not necessarily 10. It's whatever the output. Suppose I do k-means with five clusters, how many outputs I'm going to have? Five outputs. So let's say that only comes in three outputs. This is part of the algorithm that you've run, like k-means. This is whatever the truth is given to you. In 20 news groups, what is the truth? So all those subsets of tags, there's probably a hundred of them, right? 
So what do we put in each cell? This would be in MNIST, there's a category, like in, in the image can be a three or a seven. Right? And the output in here, if I do k-means, those would be the clusters, group one, group two, and group three, right? So what do we put in here? What does it come in this cell? In a confusion matrix? Right? Count. So in a confusion matrix, we look at the grid on all the truth values, subsets, label tags, uh, you know, what, whatever truth is given to me, versus the output of my algorithm, which in KNN is a classification, in clustering it's a group ID, whatever you, you run as an algorithm. And you have this matrix of how many truth classes you have versus how many output classes you have. And what you're doing inside is count. By the way, if this would be a soft clustering, I have three groups. The problem in the another partition, a particular data point, it's 80% chance to go to group one, 15% chance to go to group two, and 5% chance to go to group three. What would this be then? How do I generalize this count notion to soft clustering where each data point is not, membership is not a zero one thing. Membership is a distribution of those groups, right? So a particular image may come 80, 15, 5%. What would I do here? One person at a time. Sum of the probabilities. Sum of the probabilities. Mm. So I would sum up in here, not the one, the membership one zero, like to get the count, but in this case 80, 15, 5, this will sum up a 0. 0.15, this will sum up a 0. 0.8. We'll talk about that later, but this notion of confusion matrix, which is a fundamental notion in a lot of the algorithms we do can be extended very easily to soft clustering if I want to. So now, if I do this, what kind of matrix would indicate a good clustering? How this matrix should look like to say I've, I've done with somebody else. So you look at somebody gives a confusion matrix. Hey, here are my M these digits, right? The 10 categories. Here's my output of clustering. I'm not showing you the output. I'm showing you just the confusion matrix. That is, say, I do eight groups clustering against 10 digits. And it shows you all the counts. The count should be higher across the diagram. Uh, close, but inexact. Didn't think enough bigger he spoke. Why it has to be close or has to be high, but why on the diagonal? Because it's across the output and the truth, right? So can it be high on this diagonal? No, no, no. From, the, from the top left to the bottom. I understand, but I'm saying that's not true. I think you want some counts to be very high and some counts to be very low. But they don't have to be on the diagonal. There's no guarantee that class one corresponds to cluster one. Maybe this group one, it's actually cluster three, right? Again, clustering does not give you Group one, it tells you those corresponds to the one digits. Okay? So we want some counts to be high, high indicating all the points that were a seven went to this group. It doesn't matter which group it is, right? It, it went to one group. So what we want, if we look at the column here, is what? A column corresponds to all the trees in my data. <coughs> What's a good indication that clustering work if I'm only looking at the columns? It would be a lot of zeros except for one cell. So what we want if you look from the truth perspective, we want all these trees to go to one group. Right? And that has to be true for all columns. If this is maybe, this is the ninth here. That's because from the truth perspective, there's 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, up to 9, right? We want this to be high maybe on one of them and 0 on the other. In other words, we want the particular class, like the trees, to not distribute too much across the clusters, to go all in one cluster. How about from a row perspective? What's a row? One cluster. That's back to the one group and says, okay, uh, in this group you have 
maybe some zero, some one, some two, some three, some nines, what would be an indication of good clustering? Same. We want one to have high count and the other ones to not have high count. Now, this is only possible, ideally, to have exactly every row and every column. So let's write here the ideal. Every row or column. Actually, let's write in every row has only one non-zero cell. This indicates what? That inside the cluster, I only have one class. So inside a row corresponds to a cluster. So row or cluster are the same thing. So inside cluster, it's only one class. The other notion that we want is for column. A column corresponds to a label, and we want to have only one non-zero cell. That means a class does not distribute over classes. So the, I mean, that's a principle. I think we can all agree that we don't want the cluster to have too much of, of every, every class, and we don't want the class to distribute too much over the classes. Please note that these are not enforcing each other. I can have a class distributing over clusters, but still each cluster contains objects from only one class. Okay. So just enforcing one of them does not automatically give you the other. That would be an exercise in the homework. Give me an example where I can get one property but not the other. Okay. Give me both ways. So you need to enforce both. The problem with enforcement as a measurement, we don't want to measure things, evaluate clustering as black and white. Either it has this property, non-zero, non-zero, we call it good, or it doesn't have the property, so we call it bad. That's not the kind of evaluation we're looking for. We're looking for a gradual evaluation. So it's not enough to say it has it or it doesn't have it. We have to come up with a formula that indicates gradation. We have to say, okay, it has it, kind of, a little bit, more, a lot more, it's perfect. You know, we, we want a scale. We can't say it's either zero or one. So how do we measure those things to allow for gray area to say, OK, it doesn't have it at all, all the way to it has it perfectly, but with a lot of intermediate points? We do what? If we look of this row, here's a row. We look at it. It's count, 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 all the way to how many counts are here? Number of truths, right? That's a row. How many? In the MNIST data set, I'll have 10 counts. How do I come up with a formula? Is there some mathematical formula that would work for me to say, the more these counts become having this property, like one of them contains everything and the others are zero, the more that formula shows that. There's a natural concept in mathematics that takes these counts and give you exactly that. How far away are you from this situation? So there's two extremes here. One situation is one count is non-zero, the other ones are zero. And the other extreme situation is? What's the opposite of one non-zero and the rest of zeros? Uniform. So this could be the, the bad situation for me is to be uniform. And the good situation is to have maybe 100% on one, and then zero, 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 and zero, zero, right? That's the good situation. So how do I take these counts and design a formula that has this good and bad property? And 
everybody knows a formula or, or some concept that could I don't want it the black and white. I don't want to say it's either this way or that way. I want to have ability to measure in between. Because clustering, like everything in practice, will not never come black or white. You're never going to get either 0 or 100%. Question. I might just ask you there is a concept in statistics that deals with this. Yes. I mean, I'm not, I don't know the exact word for it, but like if you have a Gaussian curve, for instance, the however thin or wide it is, if it's thinner, then it has a very specific peak. I don't. I'm not sure. I don't think we can take the count and, and fit a maybe fit a Gaussian value to them. Um, but the problem is, if all the counts are the same. I'm not sure I understand what you're saying. Or yeah. then they're gonna look like uniform. You get a mean. The counts are different. You also get a mean. Like, is the concept of variance useful here to say? It's not the variance that I'm looking for. You guys know entropy. It's a function. It's usually called h. It's of a distribution. But I can transform the counts easily into a distribution if I want to, right? So the entropy of C1, C2, C, T normalize, divide by the sum of CI, right? Usually it's called, it's used, it's used as a distribution, but you can easily plug in counts. What is the formula? Minus P probability. Is minus what? Uh, probability. Of the sum of Probability. Negative probability. Log of probability. One over the probability, right? It's something like that. Now, who's pi, of course? pi will be the count divided by the sum of counts, right? pi, each, each normalized version of the count. Now, you've got to be careful a little bit. You're responsible with engineering. I'm responsible with telling stories on the board. You can't really do it with zeros. If one of the counts is actually zero, which is a good thing, right? We want zero. When you normalize, you get a zero. And then one over zero, boom, doesn't work. So a little bit of something is needed there because you can't divide by zero. But I'm sure we know how to deal with those. So this entropy. Is it working the way I want? Is it, uh, what happens? When is this entropy very high and when is it very low? So yes. We want low entropy because. We want low entropy because low entropy corresponds to these situations. And high entropy corresponds to these situations. So this is H high and this is H low. Now, entropy is not the only formula that could be applied here. A lot of people, a lot of books will tell you, this is the way it must be done. Don't believe that. And even me, I'm going to say that. Do not believe it. What's important in all these problems, evaluations, algorithms, is the principle. The exact formula, there are many formulas who can take a bunch of counts and determine how close are they to 100% 0, 0, 0 versus uniform. And in different problems, you may want to use a different formula. There's nothing wrong with designing a different formula if you are in a particular domain and you need it. What's important here is the principle. You want something that indicates how far are you from these situations. Entropy is nice because it has a lot of theoretical background, a lot of mathematical background, but it's not the only thing you can do. So now that's for a row. I could do the same for a column, right? So I'm not going to do it again, but I could point out if I have a column, I have these counts, say D1, D2, up to, this is how many outputs are in my algorithm, right? If I have K clusters, there'll be D counts. Now this is a column for class, a specific class, for example, class uh, six, right? If I have digits. Each column corresponds to a particular class. And I could apply the entropy here, D1, D2, Dk. 
normal life. And the entropy, if it's low, is going to tell me that's good. That class fits in one cluster. It doesn't distribute too much. And if it's very high, it means it distributes all over the place. Now, the nice things about any such formula is that it's not black and white. It's not either 0 or 1. Some entropies will be 0 0.2, others will be 0 0.3, 0 0.9. So overall, you don't have to get a black and white. You can average all this entropy, say, if I average by rows, I average all the rows, so I get an entropy for each row, I average it. I will know how well each, on average, class is distributes over components. And if I average these entropies this way, I will know how well the clusters distributes over labels. Of course, ideally, is to have all these entropies equal zero. That will indicate perfect partitioning. That will be, I have exactly one cluster per one class, and all the points in that class go to clusters, and that's perfect. But you're very rarely going to get something that close. Another thing that you want to pay attention, this is absolutely optional. It's uh, theoretical. When you pick such a function, you want to satisfy the extremes. You want to say, OK, the function indicates if it's high, is that. If it's low, is that. But you want to look at the shape of the function. So what I mean is this. Here are those two situations that say this is bad, this is good, and this is my entropy. So in the bad situation, what is the entropy? It's very high. You can actually compute this is about log of how many things I have, log of the number of items. You can compute this formula for uniform probabilities. You're going to get log. It's easy to see. The sum is going to cancel with the 1 over each p is 1 over how many there are. So when you sum up, that goes away. And this is 1 over count, 1 over how many classes are there. 1 over 1 over that is going to be log over the count. And when it's good, what's my value? Zero, right? So let's write here. Now, of course, I got those two points here and here. Zero. People who really do data science in practice and need evaluations are typically the people assigned to QA groups. What's QA? Quality assurance. Quality assurance. Now, I'm talking about real engineers who works at Google Quality Assurance and Bing Quality Assurance and Amazon Quality Assurance. There's, the, there's an entire specialty for how to do that, OK? Maybe one day we'll teach a class in Quality Assurance. It's not just the function. It's the shape of it that matters. So I can have a function that's this way. 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 There are many kind of functions that will give me high, low. But how do I, what the shape of the function will determine in my evaluation? What's the difference between this kind of function? Of course, entropy is one of those. You, you can figure out which one is entropy. But why, when would I, what would this function mean versus what does this function mean? This function here, the top one, says most of the values, most of the situations in your clustering algorithm are similar to bad. Right? This top function says, unless you are exactly at the very, very, very end of being good, then only then I'll give you the price. If you are e even here, when you are like, like almost good, you still get the value like being bad. Because if you look at the function, this value here is pretty close to the bad value. Right? So what is this function good for, this top function? It says, the only time when you get to be called good is when you are almost perfect. This is the kind of function that you say, everything that's not very, very good is bad. I, I need it to be like transactions for money when I charge credit cards. I want to say succeed when I actually succeeded, right? I can't afford to have 15% of the credit card transactions go bad, and nobody will buy anything from me, right? Like, what, what, how many transactions on Amazon they fail at the credit cards, you know, something goes on? It's probably one in 300 million transactions. 
So this is the kind of problem, or you imagine critical situations with a, say, a medical device. Failure means people die, right? So if this number of failure is more than, say, one in 10,000 or so, it's not acceptable. Or airplanes, right? Everything fails occasionally. Airplanes do crash, but if the rate of airplane crashing would be more than one in 100,000, nobody will fly, right? If I tell you the chance of crashing is 1%, would you take the plane back home? Probably not, but we'll book the ship, right? <laughs> There's situations where good has to be 99.999999% good to be acceptable, and that's the top function. It says good has to be very good. How about this other one? It's the opposite, right? Yeah. That says most values are good. So unless you are terrible, you get the price, right? You get to be called good. So when you design an evaluation, I'm not going to insist any more than this. It's not just the two values. It matters how you evolve between them because from a quality assurance point of view, you're never going to get black or white. Quality assurance people always get values in between, and they need to interpret these values. And then it matters a lot which kind of function is being used as a score. All right. So I think that's what I have to say about labels. There are some very important concepts here that you should know no matter what. Even if you fail this course, you won't. But even if you do, you should know what the confusion matrix is. That is an absolute fundamental thing. And then for our purpose, clustering, we should know how to look into this confusion matrix. And then once we know what we want, we can design some formula to achieve that. Yes? Is it true if I say that that kind of a clustering will only happen when we have uh, data that doesn't follow the form shape? Yes. So for k means, this is an evaluation independent of the algorithm used for evaluation. So that's actually another thing that you want to know. Is this evaluation designed independent of the algorithm, or it specifically only works for k-means? I say it's independent of the algorithm. I could do this evaluation here, no matter how the clustering was proved. You're right. It's never going to work very well if the data doesn't have the globular shapes. That's not the problem with evaluation. That's a problem with k-means. If the data doesn't have that shape, k-means will not work right. And we're probably going to notice that. Yes? How do you enforce uh, the, the constraint of one class per label in, in this particular problem? Since we talked about separately having entropy for row that, and That happens in here. The more each row and each column contains exactly one non-zero count, that is guaranteed to happen. However, it cannot be enforced if I have three groups and ten labels. It's just not possible, right? But if you look at this matrix, the ideal matrix, confusion matrix, is always a non-zero value on each row and each column. That's bound to happen. It doesn't tell you which class goes to what cluster. That, that, so that's back to the, it's not necessarily the main diagonal. Right? But it, it's, think about it, that's bound to happen here. Now, this, if you have labels, that's the last thing I'm going to say here. If you have labels, and the labels are somehow in sync with your purpose, what I mean by that, suppose I have a bunch of patients and I care their uh, heart disease and stuff like that, right? So I have a lot of measurements like blood tests and age and family values about that all relates to heart disease, right? That's in my data. I can use labels for evaluation, so I cluster my patients, right? And I get clusters. Now, does it make sense to use the labels if I have some labels for those patients? It only makes sense if the labels are related to the problem I have. If I cluster those patients based on heart disease tests and the labels are their grades in school, in data mining course, that's not related to the data I just clustered, right? I mean, I could perform the evaluation as far as the math goes, but it's not gonna indicate anything. They probably, data mining grades does not, it has nothing to do with the blood pressure and heart diseases, right? Hopefully. <laughs> uh, so my point is, when do you use the labels? 
it's not about the algorithm. The algorithm doesn't use the labels. The algorithm classes the patients as they are, or the documents. But then, if my labels for documents for the patients to make to make sense of as evaluation, they have to be related to the purpose of that cluster. Usually, they are. Like you'd expect those digits, right, to cluster by the label. You'd expect that the last digits clustered together, they should have roughly the same digits, right? So then I would say for MNIST data set, it's totally fine to use those digits as labels to do the evaluation. But be careful with that. If you just got a bunch of documents from the web and you cluster them, and then somebody else annotates those documents by a very different criteria that nothing to do with what you extracted from them, then this may not work. But if it is the case that the labels relate to the task, this is much more powerful as evaluation. So if you have labels, even not for all your patients, right? I don't need all the labels. I could just evaluate the data for which I have labels. If I have labels, like for these digits, and you cluster them, I could tell immediately if the clustering worked by looking at the labels, the confusion matrix, and this matrix much better than if I do not have the labels. The only time I will not use the labels is because I declare them irrelevant to the clustering task, like data mining grades for the purpose of heart disease. So what do we do here? So we here, I think, you guys got the story. There'll be some formulas to implement. This will be very easy to run as a computer program, no problem. But what, what about here? In here, we needed to cook up some sort of formula that doesn't have labels. So how do I say I want the distances in each cluster to be small? Uh, sorry, distance is small, similarity high. And across clusters to be big. Suppose I want to run a formula that's something like for each Two, pair, two data points, right? This is all pairs of data points. I'm going to look at the similarity ij, right? That's the similarity. And I want to say, I want this to be high if those two things are in the same cluster. So I'm going to have a predicate here that says pi uh, i say cluster i equal to cluster j. That's saying if the two clusters for these data points are the same cluster, remember this is a hard partition, so every data point goes to exactly one cluster. If this is true, I want this to be high. And the other sum, all pairs, similarity of ij when what? Cluster I is different than cluster J. I want those to be small. So I need a mathematical formula overall that sums up all the similarities. You can sum it up in two groups. The group of similarity that's in the same clusters, that's summing up all the pairs, not just the ones in this cluster, all the pairs from all clusters, that one's high. And I want this one to be low. Maybe then I subtract them or do something with those sums. There will be some formula suggested in the homework, but this is what I would rather do here. I would like to try a few formulas and see what works. Like I said, there is no magic formula that works all the time. There's in clustering evaluation, there's probably at least 20 ways to work. But what we want here, if you don't have labels, is to enforce some intra-cluster property and extra-cluster property. And then we can also do some weighting. If we think those clusters are very disproportionate in size, which we know, we know how many points are in each cluster. We may want to base this formula on those proportions. OK, this took a lot longer than I wanted to. So now with that, let me show you something.
So I wanted to say a few things. I, I don't think we're going to have time for all of them. Uh, so I, I may have to leave some for Monday. So for the clustering with OK Azos, uh, will there be a chance for like user to interact and actually help in a Right, right. That's not included here. But that's another thing that people do in QA a lot. Instead of using a mathematical formula, try to visualize what happened in a cluster. Get the closest points to the center rate. Get the farthest points from the center rate. And try to figure out, with a human perception, why this point is in this cluster if it's so far away from the center rate. Human perception sometimes works a lot better than the similarity function, especially for documents and images. Because I can see in an image things that the algorithm couldn't extract. Or I can see in a document a meaning that unigrams or bigrams don't tell me. So yes, that's an absolute vital part of QA. Look with your eyes. Visualization may be difficult. How do you display multidimensional data? Sometimes not easy. But understanding why usually the, the anomalies are the most interesting ones, the ones that is very far away but had to get to that cluster. Why is that? Um, so, One thing I want to point out here, uh, if one of you can turn off the lenses and turn them back on, it's the, to the left side. Yeah. So, yeah. Back on. So, he does the white balance. One thing I want to say here, that probably we not have enough time for it, but in hierarchical clustering, remember, is the one that joins the closest similarities. The, there is a matter of efficiency. Initially, I start with all the matrix of everybody similar to everybody. But eventually, those things become big groups. So at, at any point in time, remember in hierarchical clustering, when I join two things, either objects, or individual objects, or groups, I replace all the components joined with a group. So from there forward, I only have that group. There will be no more similarity between the individual images or points against other things. The efficiency question is now, before joining them, I have the similarity for every object or every subgroup to the other ones. That's how I decide to join them, because they were very similar, right? But now, I need to compute the similarity from my group against everybody else. Let me draw that really quick. And this is something we're going to have to talk about next time. Here's my object. This could be some groups or individual. I'm talking about in the middle of the algorithm. And they have similarity against all kinds of other points. This is the rest of the points or the rest of the groups. And everybody has the similarity with everybody, right? That's what allows me to determine, hey, you need to group those things together. In practice, you do two at a time. You don't group all of them. But say I group those things. Now, how do, what do I need to proceed to keep going with this algorithm, right? Because I keep going bottom up. I need out the similarity for this big group. Remember the individual things that got grouped. They're never going to be used as individual things anymore. So everything gets replaced with this group. So I need now a similarity from this big group to every one of the other stuff, right? So the efficiency procedure has to do with, if I had all the individual similarities before, how do I determine the new similarity for the joint object to the remaining ones? Because I, I don't want to recompute everything from scratch. Right? So that's something you need, you're going to need to figure out in your homework. The, the similarity, it's whatever it is, it's, you know, the Euclidean distance or cosine or dot product. But once things get grouped, I need to replace the objects being joined with the group itself, and I need a similarity from the group to the rest of whatever was. Now, I, I need to do that fast enough. That's one thing I need to say about this. But the rest of it is engineering. The other thing that I want to uh, show you here, discuss a little bit more detailed about this uh, density can paint kind of algorithm. We all understand how that goes intuitively, right? 
it gets put in a point and it colors everything that it can reach to. And when it can't reach anything, it starts a different color. But people have worked on this principle a little further. And this is how it actually works. All the points in my data set are determined, this is a simpler version, the more sophisticated ones, into three categories. One category is, um, so first of all, this epsilon thing, that's a neighborhood in the same way like you guys had for KNN. The neighborhood of a point. Remember the KNN version that says all the points within a certain distance to it? Right? So epsilon serves like a radius here. Take all the points that are within that radius from my point based on distance of similarity that I've decided to use. In all these things, distance and similarity does not change. If you do dot product, you're going to stick with dot product. If you do cosine or Euclidean, you're going to stick with that one. So neighborhood, it's exactly the KNN neighborhood that we determined before based on a radius. It's not the top 10 or 20. It's whatever fits in the radius. So now I have this categorization of points that says I have the points for which the neighborhood is at least that many. We talked about this at KNN. Right? When we said pick a radius, there was an issue that for some points in that radius there would be a huge number of neighbors. While because the radius is fixed for some other points, there will be very few points. So there's a threshold that says if your neighborhood is rich, then that's a core point. If your neighborhood, if you belong to a rich neighborhood, but you don't have a rich neighborhood, <clears throat> That's called a border. So a point might be part of some other point, big, rich neighborhood, but itself may not have a rich neighborhood. How can that happen? How can I get a point that doesn't have a lot of uh, points around it, but it's inside of some dude that has, this is a very dense neighborhood for this. This is a core point, right? And I have one point here that if I draw the radius of this guy, it doesn't have enough points in it. But it's himself, it's in a neighborhood with a lot of points. That's called a border point. And there is everybody else, which is, you can call isolated or outlier. It's not in a rich neighborhood and does not have a rich neighborhood. I mean, if it's not in a rich neighborhood, obviously it doesn't have a rich neighborhood. So this is kind of like inside the density, at the periphery of some density spot, and outside any density region. And um, some drawings here of how that works. What, some examples too. Uh, so we can go over this stuff, what's a border, how it looks, what's a core. What people have done here is to write this algorithm, the pain can, in terms of this notion, core border noise. So our job theoretically, doesn't matter for the homework, but theoretically is to say, hmm, you told me you put the pain can and it's gonna color the thing, but these instructions here, I don't know how the pain can works according to this instruction. So we have a conceptual job of saying, how, how does the paint can painting the, the thing relates to eliminate noise points? What does that mean? Why do I eliminate the noise points? Yes? Because they're not reachable, right, by the paint can. They're far away outside of any neighborhood, not reachable. So I'm not going to ignore. I could, I could color each noise point its own color if I really want to, but those are not interesting points. They are not reachable by the paint can, right? And then um, put an edge between all core points that are inside an epsilon neighborhood. So what this is saying is that both those things are core points now, P1 and P2. They, they core points, meaning they all have rich neighborhoods. And then inside each other neighborhood, put an edge between them. What this edge stands for in the paint analogy? What does it mean? It means what? 
they will be colored in the same color. Same color. Whatever paint, you, even if you drop the, if you don't drop the can, the can paint on one of them, you drop it somewhere. If that color reaches one of them, it's gonna be to reach the other because they are in the density neighborhood. The density will translate the color first, right? And then you have to walk through this algorithm. And and when you when you implement this for your homework, you're not gonna have a paint can, right? <laughs> and do nothing with it. Right? We don't mean any drawings. You're gonna have to have a computer science pseudo code to go by. Right? So you're gonna use something like this. You can imagine Zip as a, a sort of a graph infrastructure. If, if you can you can organize it in your mind like a graph. Here are my points, they have edges in between them, and then there is a graph algorithm perhaps that splits into components, those edges, and those would be my clusters, right? Or something like that. Right? But the paint analogy is the best one to know the principle of the algorithm. Right? I think it's very easy to understand this kind of density-based algorithms with a paint can. But then when we implement it, we need an actual computer science methodology. So that is that in here. Uh, they even give you some pseudo code for how to do this. These are easy to find. So what's going to happen here? Um, The, prob the biggest problem with density algorithms is deciding the neighborhood radius. Because this is very hard to estimate from data in advance, like what's the radius between the, these, these images. Remember, you don't have the labels. If I, ha if I give you the labels, I tell you all these guys are sevens and all these guys are nines, you can figure out what distance you need so that seven and nines can get kind of separated, but the sevens are not separated and the nines are not separated. But if I don't give you the labels, now you have a bunch of images, points in 784 dimensions, and you say, like, I need to separate some from the other. But what happens if the radius is too small? It, the color doesn't propagate, the paint can if you start at the seven, doesn't go to the other sevens because the radius dictates how far it can go. What happens if the radius is too big? You color too much. So if the data looks like this, visually, you can probably figure out what the epsilon needs to be, right? You can say, probably those are gaps between different classes, so I need a gap that big. And inside those things, those should be in the same class, so I, I want a gap that doesn't allow the paint can to cross this thing here, but it allows to go all the way here. But that's easy for a person, a human, to look at the image and say, hmm, that's how it looks, right? You have a matrix of values, of double values. How do you determine this? I think for this class, we're gonna do trials and errors, a lot of them. Start with the radius, see what happens. Oh, we've got all the images together, shrink it down. Oh, wait a minute, now, now there are too many classes of sevens, you know, bump it up until we find the right radius. Um, obviously, this, these are the trivial examples where this kind of algorithm works because you can tell if this is the shapes you want to distinguish, uh, I guess actually these are red versus green versus blue, but the projector doesn't work. If that's what you want, density-based algorithms will do very well, what K means will do terrible because there's no globular shapes to be found here. On the other hand, if you apply k-means, you're going to get some sort of uh, globular blues versus globular greens. Those are the same points, right? Or this half versus that half, right? So th this, this, this example is designed to showcase when you want density-based algorithms. You have a lot of density inside the class and nice gaps across the classes. The advantage of these algorithms is that they follow whatever shape you have, just like the paint can. You don't have to worry if the shape is globular or not. K means have to assume shapes, so K means can work quite well if the assumption holds. Now the biggest problem for these algorithms, uh, assuming you can figure out the radius, is not typically the density in the class. That's a problem, but some, most of the time that's satisfying. The problem is the unusual anomalies, the very rare 
images mislabeled or misspelled that happen to be in between. Because for this kind of algorithms, the biggest problem is going to be the accidental crossing of the paint can to the class it doesn't need to cross. You know, it doesn't take too much to be able to cross. I can have a million points, and just I need a few points to be able to cross. <coughs> and data always have anomalies, always have points that are in between, things that could not have been classified. We don't know what the digit is. The image is not actually a, div a digit, it's a tiger, and has been by, by mistake put in that data set, so it shows up in the middle somewhere. So I think the biggest concern with these density-based algorithms is can you enforce that it doesn't cross across classes? Obviously, if I have a uniform density of points, I cannot do anything based on density on those. <coughs> Everything is going to be uniform. That's the second thing I want to say about this, with some technical details about how to implement it. And uh, now, I don't know how many of you know Cheng Li. He's uh, my PhD student. He's a world-class machine learning expert. When I don't know something, I ask him. So you know. Uh, uh, so we're going to do some demos here. Uh, I'm going to do a demo first. And I'm not going to use real data. <laughs> you know. So he's going to use real data. But I'm going to use uh, artificial data. So there's a this nice uh, website with an applet here. This is a density DB scan. It's a density based algorithm. That's how it's called DB scan. And what we're going to do, we're going to create some sort of data. Let's say we use density bars. Right? Uh, and um, this in here is going to use the paint can. Right? Let's see what it does. It goes and colors. As soon as something is colored, if there is points in the neighborhood that are reachable, it colors that with the same color. right? And if the gap is this is all like showcase with the proper data, proper gap, proper everything. If the gap is not reachable on the other side, it's going to have to use a different color. Right? This can be very well described in terms of a graph algorithm. So if, you, if you're familiar with paths and connectivity in graphs, this could be very well formulated that way. So when it reaches the border, it, it, it goes as much as it can, but then it it's going to color other things with other colors because they're not reachable from the current colors right? until it finishes the whole thing. Now let's try it again. Let's try this. That's going to be a Gaussian mixture creates high densities around the centers of the Gaussian and low densities on the periphery of the Gaussian. Um, this is easy to visualize in 2D, right? Because we have experiments with I agree. Right, so that's your homework too. <laughs> we, we'll give you some pointers, okay? I think most people, especially when they study these things, they, you gotta do some trial and error. I, I feel sorry for your time on this homework to the next two weeks. But the reality is, until you try things, you never can be believe it. So it's not gonna be a step of do this, 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 and that. It's gonna be tried out, see what happens. Um, so let's try this one here. I think this is going to go a lot easier because you can see there's huge gaps in between. Uh, I'm not sure all the points are going to be colored one way. Maybe one of these is outside there is going to have a different color. Maybe not. But this is very intuitive what happens, right? Let's try a different one. Uh, how about smiley face? This is the ratio of the beam points. Beam point is this, how many points do I need to declare this a rich neighborhood? If I increase the mean ratio, I decrease the number of points. Um, and this is the epsilon. So let's increase this neighborhood. A bigger, bigger epsilon is gonna reach further. So there's these two parameters. How far do I want to reach? And how many points do I require to declare that the core point? Right. OK. 
Okay, you want to see one more? It's called uniform. What happens in uniform if I make the epsilon really big? I'm going to get everything done, right? What happens if I decrease the epsilon? Nothing is reachable. Now I get something is reachable, right? Because the epsilon reaches not that far. Increase this back, I start getting more points. I'm sure this is very intuitive, but it's nice to see it visually. Okay, how about k means? In k means, there's a lot of back and forth. So Chen's gonna, che gonna talk a little bit about this with real data, initialization, getting stuck, uh, and so on and so forth. And there's one important slide that maybe I should uh, talk about a little bit. In here, it asks me about the centroids. What is I'll choose? Manually, I pick them. I don't want to do that. Randomly means? Let's choose this, random. And then say, okay, uh, let's do um, smiley face, for example. Random means, uh, when I say add centroid, it's gonna do what? Pick one at random, right? And say, I wanna do three. Now, K means, remember, there's a hard partition between the two centroids. This line here, is that line I draw on the board last time that says everybody on this side is gonna be red and everybody on this side is gonna be blue. There is a line between green and, uh, and blue, right? And there is a line between green and red and you can prove with geometry quite easily that in the case of three, they have to intersect. The circle that goes through these three points must have the center in here. It's a very simple geometrical property that you should have seen in the fourth grade. So now I start k-mean. Of course, k-mean is going to oscillate. It's going to move the centers, then repartition the points, then move the center. Well, let's see how that's going to go. Right? Update, update, update. I think it's almost closed now. When is this thing going to finish? when nothing moves anymore. It's probably like anything in machine learning. Initially moves a lot, and then it's very slow after that, right? All updates. Okay, let's try this again. Farthest point means what for centroids? I pick one, and then one far away, and then as far away as I can, right? Let's not try smiley face. Let's try something else. Density bars. Add centroid, one. The next centroid will be where? as far as possible. The next centroid will be where? As far as possible. Yeah? Let's, uh, let's see what this does. Yeah. It's converged already. Yeah. <laughs> right? Try one more time. Well, random. Mm, uniform point. Add centroid. Another centroid. Random means random, so it's unlucky to have two centroids closed, but it can happen. Here's another one, here's another one, four centroids, right? Let's, uh, let's see what this says. Now, these four lines, or how many they are, they won't intersect all together. It's a geometrical property that says all three of these lines, any triplet of three must intersect in 2D. So you can see how they, this one between uh, yellows and reds intersects the other ones. This calls the Venn diagrams, for the Venn diagrams. Okay. So now I'm gonna let Cheng demo some stuff. He's working on your homework too. You know? uh, and, and he's gonna show you something with real data. The projector is funny, but you know, If you don't finish, we can demo some next week. 20 minutes, maybe? 15, 20 minutes? Okay. Kira. 
is a handwritten digit. See here, all handwritten digits. So here we will apply key means to see if we can find any interesting clusters. Okay. So each uh, image here is represented by a 28 by a 28 uh, pixel matrix. So internally you can use a uh, 754 dimensional vector to represent uh, each image. So this matches what you learn in the class, right? You need to run key means on a vector, not a matrix. So you do it, uh, you do a transformation first. Okay, now let's give it a try. Here I'm just running a very simple experiment. I run key means on 100 uh, images, and I'm using a uh, 10 different clusters. of the algorithm. Mm -hmm. I have 10 uh, initial clusters and I run key means for five iterations. So for each iteration I have uh, 10 updated clusters. Let's just go to the final result and see what we get. Uh, this is um, cluster one. Doesn't look very good, right? <laughs> So um, in each folder, I put the center of the cluster as the first picture. <laughs> so this is not a real image from the data set. This is the centroid of this cluster, represented by a 784 dimensional vector. And I uh, plot this vector uh, by interpreting the pixels, the, the values as pixels another cluster. Let's get some three, some, some five, some eight. This uses yeah. Euclidean distance? Yeah, Euclidean distance. Oh, this cluster is less, I guess. So most of them are zero. We get five here. This is the uh, um, final clusters. That's, uh, to the, uh, the initial clusters. So here I'm using a random initialization. I basically just pick a random point as a centroid for each cluster. So here, in this initial step, you can see the center is actually a real image. While in later iterations, you do not get real images at the centroid. So this is the uh, initial cluster one. Initial cluster two, initial cluster three, as well. Okay, so let's uh, look at what happens when we run key means. This is the log log of the training process. So basically, I first initialize all clusters. I randomly pick an instance for each cluster at the centroid. Then I assign each instance to its uh, nearest cluster. I compute the distance between each image and the, each centroid. Then I assign all 100 images to the correct clusters. This finishes the initialization step. Then I go to the first iteration. So in each iteration, we, iter we uh, iterate between those two steps. We update all uh, cluster centroids and then we reassign each instance to the correct uh, clusters. For example, here we first update the centroids bigger. 
then we reassign each instance to a new cluster. You can see here, for this uh, image, we assigned it to cluster 4, but it was in cluster 10. Maybe it's interesting to look at this instance. Let's see. This is a, I don't know what instance it is. Yeah, I have the... it belongs to this cluster. <coughs> then after one update, we move it to a different cluster, which is cluster four. Yeah, this one. I think by doing so, it made some improvement, right? Actually, k-means is designed to always uh, reduce your objective function, which is the sum of all distances between each point and the uh, centroid of the cluster it is assigned to. So, at the uh, end of the training, I also print the sum of all distances. So one way to debug k-means is to look at the change of this sum of distances to see if it always decreases. K means by design we are always uh, reduce this number. So you can see here it keeps uh, reducing until the iteration one, two, three, until iteration three, I guess. So then it just goes back. So this uh, sequence should those numbers should either decrease or stay the same. It should never go up. If it goes up, you may have a bug. So you can also see why uh, it converges after three iterations. If you look at the log here, uh, this is the initialization step. And uh, this is iteration one. We, here, we assign some points to new clusters, like this line here. assign some instances to new clusters. Iteration three. No. We don't change any assignment in iteration three. That means uh, key means has already converged. If you don't assign points, there's no way that we can update those centroids, right? Because those centroids are computed based on the uh, points in that cluster. This is a uh, key means on uh, MNIST. Um, let, let me show you something more interesting. So for MNIST, we actually know the identity of each image, meaning the label, whether it's a one, two, three, or four, and so on. So we can also apply key means to one group of the uh, digit to say, uh, digit two to see if we can find any subgroups.
one cluster. So what's the difference? You guys follow this? These are all tools, but can, can anybody say what's the difference between those two classes? They have a little yeah, buckle yeah. on it, right? But this would be very hard to evaluate. There's no labels anymore here for evaluation because all of them are tools. I can't do a label evaluation on now these clusters. But visually, I can see what the difference is because they're images. But I, I'm losing the ability to evaluate now the labels. See those um, clusters correspond to different writing styles of digits, too, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, this uh, for key means. Uh, so I, mean, I have a different data set which is very similar. Let me also show you that very quickly. is called fashion. So here we have uh, clothes, shoes, and handbags, things like that. Here again we run key means to see if we can find any interesting clusters. homework and Cheng is going to come again next week to demo more stuff. Uh, so our next, you should finish homework um, one.